Welcome back to Invested, I'm Lockie, and today we're looking at Netflix stock, one of the greatest growth stories in the stock market's history. Looking back on the stock's past performance, you can see they had a massive decline, in excess of 75% around 2011. But since bottoming out in 2011, the stock has seen an incredible run-up, rising more than 6,000% over the past 10 years, making it one of the single best performing equities over that period. On a five-year period also, the stock has delivered outstanding returns, rising almost 500% on the past five years trailing. Despite the company's outstanding performance, the stock actually had a pretty mediocre year up to around June, delivering a negative return of around 7% to its shareholders as growth doubts around the company began to emerge. However, following the release of the hit show Squid Game, the stock has surged up in price, rising around 40% from that low in June. So as Netflix stock price rises rapidly, the question becomes, is the company undervalued or overvalued, and is it time to buy? Today, I'm going to be breaking down the business for you, focusing on all the key factors, its financial strength, profitability, growth, and management, then give you a current valuation and price target for the stock going forward, telling you if Netflix is a buy, hold, or sell at this time. If you enjoy this type of content, please drop us a like down below, hit subscribe if you haven't already, and let's get into it. So opening up our screen here, we're going to start off by assessing the financial strength of Netflix. Now when it comes to assessing the financial strength of a company, there's one key metric we focus on, and that's the cash to debt ratio. And the current cash to debt ratio for Netflix is 0.49. Some investors may feel as if this number indicates Netflix is in a poor financial position. The number means that for every dollar of debt on their balance sheet, they only have 49 cents to meet that debt. What these investors are not thinking about is the very nature of Netflix's business model. They have a business model in which every single month consistently, they receive massive amounts of free cash flow from a subscription-based model. This flywheel of cash flow allows them to pay down their debts as they come due, whilst also financing the creation of new content, which additionally creates more and more cash flow for the business. This consistent influx of cash leaves Netflix in a highly advantageous financial position, able to easily meet their current debts whilst financing the creation of new content. Additionally, the consistency of this cash flow means that in the event of a downturn, Netflix would be exceptionally well positioned not only to continue creating content, but also potentially make acquisitions of other content creating firms further building out their portfolio. So despite that low figure there, I feel as if Netflix is in a fantastic financial position given the consistency and volume of their cash flows. Moving on to profitability next, let's have a look at how profitable Netflix actually is as a business. When assessing the profitability of a company, there's really two key things we focus on. Number one is the margins, and number two is the returns on equity and returns on assets the business produces. And on a margins basis, you can see down here, we've got operating margins of around 23% and net margins of around 17, 18%. Although these margins may not seem outstanding, comparatively speaking to other businesses, you look at a company like Microsoft, it has net margins of around 35, 40%. Apple, net margins of around 25%. So net margins around 18% aren't super, super outstanding. What you need to think about in terms of Netflix's margins is where the business has come from. Not too long ago, Netflix was a company losing money or a company with exceedingly low margins. But progressively over time, the business has improved its margins more and more and more and grown to the point where they're actually a fairly profitable company right now. If this margin growth was to perpetuate going forward, Netflix would be competing with the utmost competitive and profitable companies in the world. Profitable companies like Facebook and Microsoft I have believe the net margins can reach that level if the management continues to execute on their current strategy within Netflix. So operating margins and net margins are fairly healthy, but not outstanding, but the growth of those margins going forward could be incredible. Moving on to returns on equity and returns on assets, you can see returns on equity for Netflix are around 40% and returns on assets around 12.52. When assessing a business, we like to look for returns on equity and returns on assets around 20%. So on the returns on equity figure, Netflix is knocking it out of the park. They're doubling our target fantastic returns on equity, and showing the management is intelligently allocating shareholders' capital to make high returns on that equity. Returns on assets, however, are slightly lower, but that's an understandable figure given the nature of Netflix's business model at present. Being a production company, they need to continually invest in new hard assets, such as land for production sites and the equipment associated with film production. So naturally, over time, as Netflix acquires more and more of this capital infrastructure, those returns on equity will likely increase. So on a profitability basis, although Netflix isn't super outstanding at present, they're on the right growth trend going forward to become one of the single most profitable companies in the world. This is contingent, of course, upon the management continuing to execute on their strategy as they have done for the past five to 10 years. Moving down here to some basic valuation metrics, you can see there's a lot of metrics we can use to assess a business. We've got the peg ratio, the current ratio, the quick ratio, the cash ratio, a lot of fancy, fancy metrics. But when assessing a business, there's really only one of these simple ratios that I use. And that's the PE ratio, the price to earnings ratio. The current price to earnings ratio for Netflix is 61.88. 
indicating a high degree of growth expectation for the company going forward. Investors believe that Netflix will continue to compound and grow at an extremely quick rate. A PE of 62 is fairly high, and within that FANG space, it's only comparable to Amazon, which has a PE of around 60. This PE indicates the growth expectations for Netflix are immensely high. And should Netflix struggle to meet these growth targets, then that could have a massively, massively negative impact on the stock going forward. Whether this PE indicates that the company is over or undervalued isn't exactly clear. We're going to get into a more detailed DCF valuation later on, so keep watching for that. Coming down here, we've got revenue and net income. You can see between 2009 and 2020, where there's been immensely strong revenue growth coupled with relatively strong net income growth at the same time. Between 2009 and 2020, Revenue has grown from around 1,700 and 115 in net income to now 25,000 in revenue and around 3,000 net income. Massive, massive growth and highly consistent on a revenue basis at least. Looking at the same cash to debt ratio here, you can see there's been a similar exponential trend between 2009 and 2020. Back in 2009, their cash balance was only around 320 and now their cash balance sits around 8,200. Additionally, as the company has grown and solidified the consistency of their cash flows, they have decided to employ more and more debt in their operations. The debt balance back in 2009 was lower than their cash balance, but now from around 2016 onwards, the debt balance has significantly outweighed the cash on hand. Although some investors may find this concerning, I do not in the slightest. I know with the consistency of Netflix cash flows on a monthly basis, they are easily able to meet the debt obligations whilst financing operations going forward. Looking down here at returns on capital, you can see they've been fairly inconsistent for Netflix as they continue to grow and expand their operations more and more. The shift from simply streaming other content to now producing their own content has created lower returns on capital. This is understandable given the need to invest in additional capital infrastructure to build out that business going forward. You can see last year was the first time since 2011 that the company actually had positive returns on capital. This is beginning to signify that Netflix has finally built out all that capital production infrastructure and now can begin to make more positive returns on capital going forward. Taking a quick look at the Peter Lynch chart here, you can see from around 2013 to 2019, the price line significantly exceeded the earnings line within the Peter Lynch chart. This indicates an immensely high underlying degree of growth assumption within the stock. Investors believe between 2013 and 2019 that Netflix would continue to grow rapidly and thus the price line exceeded the earnings line. But now we're starting to see an occurrence where the earnings line is actually exceeding the price line. This plays into the inherent growth doubts and fears associated with Netflix stock and indicates that the stock may be trading at a slight discount to its intrinsic value at present. Having a deeper look at the margins of Netflix here, you can see they've had transitional margins over time. You can see margins were fairly consistent between 2006 and 2011. This was of course before Netflix made the shift to producing their own content. Once they decided not only to be a streaming giant, but also a production giant, margins declined swiftly. Gross margins dropped from around 36% all the way down to around 26% as they had to build out their capital infrastructure to accommodate for the need to produce their own content. But once that capital infrastructure was sufficiently built out, gross margins began to grow rapidly. Gross margins between 2012 and 2021 grew from around 27% all the way up to around 43% at present and continued to persistently grow going forward. The same trend can be seen in operating margins and net margins. In 2011, a swift drop down, and then from 2012 to present, massive growth, with operating margins growing from around 1% to 23%, and net margins growing from around 0.48% to net margins of now around 17, 18%. Phenomenal margin growth. And if the company can continue to execute on their strategy, growing these margins going forward, Netflix could become one of the single most profitable companies in the world. So if we wanted to accurately value Netflix as a business, we'd have to run something called a DCF analysis, a discounted cash flow analysis. As Warren Buffett always says, the value of any given business is the cash that it will return to its shareholders between now and judgment day. And that's what a DCF tells us. We're going to run a DCF on both an earnings per share basis and a free cash flow basis to give you an idea of how much earnings the company is bringing in and how much of that is translating to free cash flow the company can actually use to expand its operations going forward. If we come down here, we can see the earnings per share growth rate for the past 10, 5, and 1 year period. Over a 10 year period, it's been around 40%, 5 years, 92% growth, in one year, 79% growth. Do I believe that this 92% and 79% earnings growth can perpetuate for Netflix going forward? Not at all. I think these growth rates are far, far too high. And thus, if we put them into our calculation, they give us a massive price target misrepresentative of Netflix's current intrinsic value. I think a current growth rate around more 27 to 30% would be more comparable for Netflix at present and give us a more fairer indication of its intrinsic value. Given the growth concerns in place, uh, but also potential for Netflix to continue to execute on their strategy going forward. Weighing those two factors, I think a 27% or a 30% growth rate is a reasonable target. So if we want to be fairly conservative here and then put a growth rate around 27% rather than 30%, we'll roll with that growth rate, a discount rate of 8%, 
8% of course is the long run return of the stock market, and that's a fair rate at which to discount our cash flows. So those two figures there, and then our earnings per share figure of $11.10, that's taken from a 12 month trailing basis. Combining those three figures, a growth rate of 27%, discount rate of 8%, and then an earnings per share figure of $11, we come out to a price target of around $759.62, indicating about 10% upside in Netflix stock at present. So on an earnings per share basis, it appears as if Netflix is trading slightly below its intrinsic value. But now let's have a look at a free cash flow basis to give us an idea of how much of those earnings are actually translating to free cash flow for the company. If we come down here and have a look at the free cash flow growth rates for the past 10 and five years, we can see we don't actually have figures available for that because free cash flow growth has been either non-existent or has been negative over that time period. And additionally, also on a one-year basis, the growth rate has been negative 76%. This is far out of line with all the other growth metrics we associate with Netflix. Earnings per share growth was around 79%, revenue around 20%, and operating income around a 60% growth rate. And so this free cash flow figure stands out immensely. What this is indicative of is Netflix continuing to invest in that capital infrastructure. They don't have massive amounts of free cash flow being produced simply because all the cash flow is going back into either paying down their current debt or continuing to create content, powering growth for the company going forward. I don't think one can fairly value Netflix based on a free cash flow basis simply because their free cash flow is so quickly reallocated to other aspects of the business. Once Netflix matures more and more and more and is no longer such a growth player and more readily has earnings per share flowing into simple, consistent free cash flow within the business, then one can make an estimate of the intrinsic value based on free cash flow. But until that point, I think it's better to value Netflix based on an earnings per share. As the business matures later on, then I may begin to value it on a free cash flow basis. But for now, earnings per share is a far more accurate valuation of intrinsic value for me. So my current price target for Netflix would be $759.62. What investors need to consider when thinking about buying the stock is can the growth trends that have powered Netflix in the past perpetuate going forward? Prior to the release of Squid Game, there are a lot of questions about whether Netflix could actually grow consistently going forward. Investors need to be thinking about can they continue to produce content for the same quality and nature of a film such as Squid Game? Can they continue to bring in broad international pieces of content and make them succeed on the platform? If the answer to that is a yes, then I believe Netflix could be justified using an even larger growth rate, a growth rate around 30-35%. But if Netflix can't execute on that strategy, if they can't continue to produce content, if they can't continue to grow their margins, then there are significant growth risks with the stock and a potential large amount of downside if they don't hit their growth assumptions. So that was my brief yet somewhat detailed analysis of Netflix stock, a very unique high cash flow business with fantastic financial position, not by virtue of their cash on hand, but rather the cash flow being produced by operations. Profitability, although reasonable, has the potential for massive, massive growth going forward as they continue to produce more and more content and build out their capital infrastructure. Key questions investors must consider revolve around the idea of can growth perpetuate going forward and will they continue to produce content of the same nature as a film such as Squid Game, which produces viral appeal on an international basis. If you enjoyed this video, if it helped you learn something more about the business you're thinking about buying, then please drop us a like down below, hit subscribe if you haven't already. If there's a business you want me to talk about in the next video, then just comment down below and I'll see if I can get onto it. But until then, thank you and I'll see you in the next one.